Hey, you might want to bring yourself back a little back, a little bit there, Ken, on the camera. That's it. How's that? Is that okay? I'm just looking at your forehead. Fortunately, you're going to that. Like, listen, you know, my arms aren't that long. You know what I mean? You know, I'm surprised you've kept your hair after all these years, to be honest with you. Well, it is. I don't know. Are It is. Have you it, does, it's not, it doesn't come off, like, you know what I mean? Are you sure they're not implants? <laughs> it's a good fit, isn't you it? Know. It's a good fit. It's a very good fit. I mean, Jimmy's have he Jimmy's has held well, haven't they? They've held very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, guys, thanks for joining us. We got Ken Doherty. Sorry about the break in the stream. Ken, thanks very much for joining us this evening. Pleasure, pleasure. As usual, another great top snooker player coming on, talk about his career. We're going to. Who's that? Well, I don't know. You'll be here in a minute. <laughs> You'll be here in a minute. Who's that, Joe? You know? Are you talking about Joe Swale? <laughs> listen, Joe, listen, let me tell you something. Joe's been begging me to come on here for weeks. He's been begging me. But he gets, he, Ken, he gets on my nerves. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I friend, like, listen, Joe, Joe, just hang on a second, will you? Just hang yeah. on. A second. I want to leave you to the end. You, you, yeah. you can't, you're no good. Yeah, you've got it. You're done. I'm going to leave you right to the end. I'm going <laughs> to leave you right to the end. And then we'll interview me when we've got time. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. He says, yeah. okay. You'd have, okay. To do, you'd have to do Joe's in a couple of parts because he, 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 he wouldn't stop yakking on. You know what I mean? It, Kenny's worse than me. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Hey, I, I've got a terrible reputation. I've got a <laughs> terrible reputation for Scotland. Mm. Quiet as a mouse. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Right, look, Ken. Uh, I tell you, I tell you, I miss Joe on the circuit. We all, uh, we had such great fun over the years. You know, I miss, I miss having him around. You know, for the laughs and the, and the, the bit of crack and the few beers after the tournament or after you play or whatever. You know, he, he, he's great, uh, great company to be around. His jokes are terrible, though, Ken. His jokes are awful. <laughs> no, I, he can't bloody drink either. So, I mean, I don't see the excitement part of it, you know? <laughs> I know, yeah. No, he don't worry about it. It's okay. All right, he Joe? He, he, he said he's only drinking uh, twice a week now. Uh, uh, Monday to Thursday and Thursday to Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It's funny, you know, Joe was supposed to come on a few weeks ago, but... He's just waiting for some little bits of equipment to make the stream easy. He was supposed to call him with Jordan about oh, yeah. three weeks ago. With but Joe will, be oh, yeah. Yeah, Joe will be coming on. He's not as dull as I'm making him out to be. He's no, a wee no, bit no. more exciting. He's a lovely he is, guy. He's a wee bit more exciting. So, anyway, let's get down to you. Ken, you've had 30, year, 30 years so far. Yeah. 30 years, 30 year career. You know, you were. Irish amateur champion, you know, you were twice, you know, you were junior world amateur champion. You've done you've done all the junior stuff, all yeah. the amateur stuff. And then you came in, you got on the tour 1990, if I've got that right. You know, and then boom, pretty much a couple of seasons, top 16. Within a couple of seasons, you shot straight in the rankings, stayed in the yeah. top 16 for about 16, 17 years, you know, and great career. Fantastic career, you know. Six, you've won six ranking events. You've been runner up on eleven. I've looked at the stats, by the way. Done my homework for a change, boys. A little bit of research goes a long way. <laughs> and more significantly, you've had three world finals and you've won one of them. Mm. So perhaps you maybe could have said, well, maybe I could have had another one, maybe not. But that's that's touch on the first one because it was. I think it was, am I right? It was 19, it was 97. Yeah, 97, yeah. And uh, let's, have, let's have a little bit of a reflection on that and the build-up to that. Uh, well, I mean, the build-up to that year, the final was pretty bleak, you know. I'd, I'd lost to uh, Steve Davis in the Masters in London. He beat me 6-1. Uh, then I played him in the Masters here, the Irish Masters in golf. He beat me 6-1. And then uh, before the World Championship, we had the British Open down in Plymouth. And I played uh, Michael Judge, uh, my fellow countryman, and he beat me in the first round. So I had three first round losses in the three tournaments leading up to the World Championship. And uh, I, uh, I, I was going into that year, that World Championship, uh, just clinging 
clinging on to my uh, top 16 place. I'd lo- uh, if I lost my fourth round, I was I was paired up in the fourth round against uh, Mark Davis. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a lot of pressure on me because if I lost that fourth round match, I might have been, uh, been knocked out of top 16. So I went to that year, that World Championship, just uh, concentrating on winning the first game just to try and keep my top 16 place. So that was like the first match was almost like a big final to me. Right. And uh, I was under serious pressure. But the two weeks, um, and I'll never forget this, the two weeks prior to the World Championship, uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan and I decided, right, listen, in the run-up to this World Championship, let's just practice with each other every single day. Because we played in the same club and he had his table. His table was number two. My table was number three. So we played alongside each other. But we very rarely sort of played each other. We sort of, we had our, bit of a differences between our sort of times in Ilford, you know, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I said, L- listen, let's, you know, let's just practice together. No bullshit. We'll play each other every day. Best of 19, two best of 19. It's just in the in the mm-hmm. run up. I need the practice. You need the practice. And I said, it'll sharpen up the both of us, you know. So, mm-hmm. so he agreed. And uh, every morning we were there banging the door down 10 a.m. And we'd play like a best of 19 for like lose their pace at lunch or something like that, you know? And sometimes we might play two best of 19s if it went quick. And that was for the first two weeks, for the two weeks in the leading up to the World Championship. I got to play uh, Mark Davis. And uh, as I said, for me, it was cl- clinging on to my top 16. That's all I was worried about, winning that first match. And I beat in 10-8. And of course, Ronnie O'Sullivan in the first round of the World Championship that year, he made that maximum in five minutes, 20 seconds. Uh, the boat was where like uh, got so sharp because of our practice routines together and our, and our practice and match play against each other. Uh, I think I played Steve Davis in the second round, who would beat me as I said six one six one in boat masters in the, in the masters in London and the masters here. And uh, I ended up beating Steve Davis thirteen uh, three with a session to spare. He'd never been beaten at the World Championship with a session to spare. So I was the only one to inflict that on his on his uh, CV, uh, which I was very proud of. And after beating him with that score, I, I went from being under pressure in the first round and just scraping over the line to my confidence going sky high. And when I saw Ronnie O'Sullivan make that wonderful break, it was sort of, uh, it gave the both of us a great lift, you know. And uh, from then on, I played John Higgins in the quarterfinals. Uh-huh. Um. I beat him 13-8. I had a great match with him, 13-8. It's a long uh, match. I played, uh, I played uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan, I think, that year played Stephen Hendry in the quarterfinals. And Hendry, Hendry beat him. But it was a really close match. It was a fantastic uh, quarterfinal. Mm-hmm. And uh, I beat Elaine Robbie doing the semifinal, 17-7, with a session to spare it as well. And, um, of course, uh, Stephen Hendry... I can't remember who he beat in the semi-final. It might have been... Uh, Jenny, I, I can't remember who got to the semi-final that year. Was it James Watson? Uh, I'm not quite sure who, who he beat in the semi-final. Um, so I was in the final. I played two matches with two sessions to spare. I was fresh as a daisy. I was playing Stephen Hendry in the final, but he was like... It was like playing him in his own backyard because he, he hadn't been beaten there for five years. He was going for like six championships in a row, which is like, even in this day and age, it, you, you can't see anybody ever doing that, you know? Like, you mm. couldn't see, like, Judd Trump doing that or Neil Robertson doing that or, or Ding or anybody doing that. It's, it was just an incredible record that he had. So, uh, I was a huge underdog to beat him. Um, but I... I went out with a smile on my face. So I played a very relaxed game. I knew he never, he didn't like playing me because I'd beaten him a few times in finals and semifinals or whatever uh, over the course since I was a pro since 1990. So I wasn't like I was scared of him, but I was nervous. I must say because you know he has he had such a great record there. But you know, look, you you did it in the end, and, and like like some of the others who have done it, just like Sean. You know, it was all or nothing for Sean Murphy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about that world championship. Well, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I felt, you know, I felt at uh, that time that uh, this was a great sort of opportunity for me, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought that if I could do it this time round, this mm-hmm. would be uh, 
this this was like my chance you know what i mean so um that's what sort of helped me relax a little bit more like you know well it put you in good stead and it gave you lots of confidence because i mean obviously that you were practicing with ronnie and that, yeah. that i mean do, do you feel that that was a big contributor did that really yeah, really no, definitely definitely because the, the two of us as i said it sort of sharpened us up no end and um yeah. you know i just i just felt that uh going into it playing ronnie every day um uh, was good for me because i you know the both of us were beating each other but we were getting some great match practice and it was building up my confidence sort of going into it uh but that year, I had no idea I was going to win the World Championship at all. Like, I mean, I was I was just concentrating, as I said, on, on the first match, Mark Davis. And once I got over that, it was like it was like a whole weight came off my shoulders, you know? Absolutely. And, and, yeah. uh, and my confidence, my confidence went from being there right up to yeah. sky high. And um, and once I got over Davis and Higgins and then Robbie deal, I went into the final uh, feeling you know this was my chance you know i really felt i really believed that and i and i tell everybody this story like during that world championship after like i think it might have been the quarterfinals or something like that i could see myself because my memories of watching the world championship was higgins in 82 and taylor in 85 and that's why i wanted to be a world a, a, a professional uh, snooker player uh, those images I, I always remember they were there instilled in me from the age of like 12 and 13 and uh I could see my. I go. I go to bed at night. I could dream. I would just the dream of myself lifting that cup up and giving it a big kiss. You know, just like Higgins did and Taylor did, and uh, it's something that I always wanted to do. And for some strange reason, during that couple of weeks, uh, after I got over those cu couple of the initial matches, uh, I could see myself lifting it up. I thought this was a great chance. I felt fantastic, and. Um, I firmly believe that seeing that was like almost, you know, the way that they talk about visualization and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that helped me uh, so keep so calm, uh, kept kept my belief, kept my confidence. And I went out in that world championship. And even though Hendry was, mm -hmm. you know, such a big favorite against me, I was so relaxed. I was smiling. I was joking with the crowd. And that sort of was a good sort of psychological sort of ploy from my point of view, because I wanted him to know that i wasn't afraid of him you know what i mean i wanted him to know that i was enjoying this atmosphere i was loving it and that sort of yeah. uh that was sort of a little bit of psychological sort of warfare that was going on which you had to do like you know yeah but uh, you know you were the first one really to break him Did you want to put yeah. it like that? because he you know you you were i think you were henry's i mean first that was the first time he'd lost against you so i mean that was a bit of he was a bit surprised you were like ecstatic fantastic but just just going back you know a, a wee bit there sean the, you know you're obviously an amateur champion irish champion amateur world champion yeah. you know you were very very successful you, you you always looked like getting on the tour because you were better than the rest at that time did you have an inkling even then that maybe you know what i i think i can win a world championship did no you... i didn't i didn't know i went over i tell you what i did i left skill uh when i was 18 and i went over to england i started to be irish champion here and I'd lost in the first round when I was defending it in 88. And I thought to myself, look, I'm not getting any better here. I said, I have to go away. If I don't go away and see how good I am against the best in England, mm -hmm. then I don't, I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to progress. I don't know how good I can be. Mm -hmm. So uh, I made the conscious decision after I finished my leave and cert. I had 500 quid in my pocket. I got on the boat. Uh, and myself and Anthony O'Connor from Cork, we decided to go over together. We were staying in his mother's cousin's digs over there. Okay. And uh, we said, look, we'll go over there for a few weeks and uh, we'll bring our money with us. We'll see how we get on. Eugene Hughes, who was a resident professional in the Newford Snooker Centre, says, come over to me. He said, I'll get you free practice and anyway, and that'll get you started. And then you can sort your digs out. And, uh, and that's how it all started. And I just wanted to go over and see how I could get on against some of the best amateurs in the world because that's where they're all based and also they had like pro-ams every weekend over there in ireland like we'd have a tournament like once a month or once every six weeks so i was playing almost every weekend traveling to pro-ams all at the length and breadth of the country and uh, mm -hmm. that's exactly how it sort of uh, i got the practice to try and play against these lads to try and improve you know 
Good point there, Ken, actually. Take heed of that there, lads. I keep saying it to you all the time. Just because you're losing your qualifying matches on the tour doesn't mean you have to stop playing. Just yeah. looking around, playing. I have back-to-back -back pro arms every month. You can come down, you know, win £400 a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're good enough. But, yes, no, uh, very, very good point. You actually answered a few questions in one hit there. That's great. <laughs> I love it. See when it all just, like, flows. It's yeah, yeah. Really, really, really easy, easy indeed. So, the following year, after you went, after you won the worlds, you nearly did it again. Yeah. Well, wow, how did that feel? I mean, all of a sudden you 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 beat Henry and you got back into the final again. You must have you must have felt a wee bit more comfortable. I did, yeah. And I mean, it's such a a good year as a world champion, you know. And I think that sort of helped me that I didn't want to. I didn't want to sort of give up the cup, you know. I had such a great time with it, and um, I got all the way to the final again. And nobody had ever defended it for the, uh, the first time. Winner had never defended it. That's what they call the Crucible Course, you know. Uh, Joe Johnson almost did it in '87. He got back to the final, but mostly I remember when Davis won it for the first time. He lost in the first round the following year. When Hendry won it for the first time, he lost in the quarterfinals to Steve James the following year. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went back there, I just uh, I felt I'm just going to try and hold on to this cup as long as I can. You know, I kept it in in the uh, in the hotel room until I had to give it up when I when I landed there uh, when the tournament started proper. Yep. And uh, I kept fighting and fighting and fighting. I wasn't playing at my best like I did the year before, but I I just kept yep. kept sticking in, sticking in, sticking in. And we got to the final, and I played John Higgins, who was an inspirational for me. He'd made 14 centuries, which was a record that year uh, in the whole championship. And we went into the final session uh, the, on the Monday night. I was 13-11 behind. And uh, at 14-11, I potted a brown with just the brown blue and the pink black left. I put the brown into the green pocket and ended up going in off into the middle. So I went, instead of going 14-12, I went 15-11. And he sort of he ended up beating me 18 12, and that was, I think, my chance miss. But yeah, it was still, it was, it was nice to get as far as the final. But I still, when I lost it, I was devastated, you know, absolutely devastated. I always tell the story, I always tell the story, of, you know, when I won the world championship and I came home to, uh, you know, the, you know, the, there was a big street party and everybody waited at the airport and like got the open top bus through the city center and uh you know people stopping outside with beeping the horns in the cars stopping the cars balloons and people hanging out of windows office block window uh that was when i won it in 97 when i lost the final in 98 i had to get a taxi home on me own. <laughs> so uh, people would say what's the difference between winning and losing but there you go that's it in a nutshell <laughs> Very, that's a, that's fantastic. And I, I, I think somebody, I think somebody mentioned that to me before. I don't know, a long time ago. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're going to remember these things, by the way. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, just looking at your game, let's just focus on your 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 style of play. You know, I I I, I look at snicker players and a you know a, a sort of you watch them and you you try to analyze them and 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 figure out what their style is and what makes them so good. I mean, you, you, you seem to have a, yeah, you, well, you, I, mean, I suppose you are a bit, a bit of a tactician. You're a bit of a thinker, you know, and you, you've got good, pretty good temperament in that respect too. But would you say that those are your strongest parts? Well, what would you say is the strongest part of your game and, and how you made it? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I always, I always say to everybody that, uh, you know, no matter how much time, I think you froze up there, Ken. You're buzzing around there like a blue horse fly. <laughs> you heard of my game? I'm back here. I've lost you. Come back in, Ken. Okay, hold on. That's all right. How do I come back in now? Yeah. Well, just now. Uh, can you hear in. me? Can yeah, I can hear you okay. Just try and come back in. It's probably better if you try and stay in one position. Yeah. Okay. I know you're a nervous wreck. I know you're a nervous wreck. Okay. You know, uh, try and calm down. Okay. I was coming. I was coming in here just to get uh, to get uh, the charger because it runs down the battery quite a lot, doesn't it? 
Oh, does it? Right, okay. Yeah, okay, no problem, no problem. I'll tell you what, can you can you see me now? No, I can't see you. How do I get the Kick camera back? Kick yourself out. Kick yourself off. <laughs> I'll come back in again. Yeah. Right. How do I come back in now? Right, well, I'm going to... Well, do I go back out and then... Will I go back out? Yeah, just come, back out? Just, come up, just come out and then come back in again, if you can. Okay, okay. Or try and join again while you're on. Okay. Yeah. Oof. Technical issues, guys. You know, it's just one of those things. You know, can't all be as good as me. Staying on here. Ken Doherty's walking around the house like a nervous wreck. What can you do? Oh, he's back again. Oh, yeah, here we go. Three, two, one. We're going down here. Ah, is that okay? Oh. Is that okay? That's all right. Now you better stay still, or I'm going to start throwing darts at you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. You know, Sorry about that. You're not, wee, you're not a wee whippersnapper anymore. You know what I mean? You got to stay oh. put. You <laughs> yeah. know, stay put. <laughs> I've got, I've got the signal and I've got the battery lined up. We're okay. So anyway, we were talking about my. Yeah. So uh, oh. we're talking about uh, my game and practice and stuff like that. And all I would say is, yeah, I always. I always worked hard. I always practiced a lot. Um, and I loved the competition, you know. And I grew up in an era where I used to go in, like when I was a kid, I was used to go into, when I was about 13 or 14, I used to get the bus into into the middle of O'Connell Street and go around the snooker clubs. I'd have a, like a five or maybe a tenner in my pocket. And I'd go around, I'd go into the Piro in Bachelor's Walk. This would that be my first protocol. And I'd be playing guys for best of like three or best of five for a fiver. And I'd try and double up my money there. Then I'd go into the home of billiards from there. And I'd try and do the same. And then I'd end up finishing up in the Cosmo, which was downstairs. It was owned by a guy called Jack Rogers, who was Terry Rogers' brother. And in the Cosmo, they had a lot of guys that would play for money. And it was mainly doubles. But I used to try and build up my little, uh, my little uh, pocket money to go in there to play the big boys. And I was only like 14. And those guys were all older lads. And some of them had played international. Most of them had played international for Ireland. And they were all old guys. And they grew up in the time of probably, you know, the likes of Spencer and Reardon and people like that. You know, Pullman. And for me going in playing all those older boys, like these guys being in their 50s and late 40s you know when i was only like 13 14 they used to play that certain way a real sort of tight match play money game you know you take your like 24s or 32s you put a color safe and you play real hard match play snooker because you had to because you know i only had i only had as i said a 10 or maybe 20 quid in my pocket you know these guys might have had 100 or 200 quid in their pocket you know what i mean they could play for money all day long they had businesses and stuff like that. And that's how I learned to play the type of game that I, I, I'm sort of renowned for. You know, Crafty Ken. Uh, mm -hmm. but it, it's the reason I am. I, I've always played that way. is because I was always playing for money. And I was always playing these older guys who were very, very uh, hardened match players from playing mm -hmm. in the, the likes of the era of, of Reardon and Pullman and Spencer and Rex Williams and people like that. Yeah, I mean, it, like, there, there was a lot of good aspects of your game, I, th I think. And uh, I always, always say to the lads, you know, the, you look at the players on the tour, successful players, and you have you, you have a look at their behaviour over the years on the table. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you, your, your temperament's pretty sound. You know, your, your overall demeanour's pretty good. I mean, you, you held yourself together. Like, like you've just expressed there as a young player, you waited for your chances. You developed yeah. that, you know you know tactical sort of match play developed yeah, yeah, yeah. early on and 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 then developed obviously took itself to the professional yeah, game yeah yeah, yeah and that's I, mean, totally John, I mean the players who would be now obviously they've taken it higher and they've been a lot more successful than me but like you look at john higgins john higgins wouldn't have a dissimilar game to what i play mm -hmm. uh mark selby it'd be very similar yeah, and even someone like a Stuart Bingham that would have a very similar game to the way I play. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's just that the likes of John Higgins it, it would be would have been uh, he was a more prolific break builder and a better sort of long putter. But he had a, a similar game. We had a similar game, mm -hmm. very very similar game for years before 
you know, he won his four world championships, you know. And very, very similar, perhaps, maybe in, in that respect, just like you've expressed there, you're very similar types of player, uh, yeah. tactical match play, waiting for your opportunities, good yeah. tactics. And do you know, I was going to bring up, you know, the play you've I had. Was never, nine. I was never, I was never the best at, at any one particular uh, facet of the game, you know, I was sort of. I was sort of an average in each different facet, like potting, break building. You know, my safety game would probably be the best of, you know, or uh, uh, safety play would probably be the best of all the fa facets of the game. But I wasn't the best with, at any one particular facet, but sort of a high average in, in each of them, you know. And that's what sort of got me through a lot of matches and uh, would have given me a lot of consistency over the years, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, okay, you're probably you're probably not the most attacking player on the tour, maybe in that respect as well. No. Everybody has their ups and downs, I think. Yeah. You pick Ronnie, Neil, and perhaps maybe even Sean as very attacking players. Yeah, of course. Yeah, big yeah. Chats on. yeah. Whereas perhaps you yeah. Yeah, I mean they're they're fantastic. And I mean that's the way they play. That's the new game now, you know, and and uh you know it's it's great to see. I mean I love I'd love to be attacking, you know, but I, I could never, you know, be a great long putter the way they were. Uh, and I wasn't as prolific build, break builders as the likes they were. But, you know, that's why I played the way I did, because I felt I was going to get be more successful at it, you know? I, have, I mean, just for, the, just for the benefit of the, the, the young players out there, Ken, who are trying to get on a tour, I mean, how, how important is things like composure, temperament, you know, and, and how you structure yourself and how you wait for your upper. I mean, how, how important are these things? I think they're very important. I mean, even if you look at now, say, for example, Judd Trump, okay? Now, he is one of the most attacking, if not the most attacking player on the circuit at the moment. However, mm -hmm. he wasn't as successful as he has been over the last couple of years until he changed his game slightly. He became a bit more patient. I think he he uh, he understood that to compete with the likes of the the John Higginses or the Mark Selby's or even the Neil Robertsons of this world, that he had to be a little bit more measured in his approach. He could still go for the long pots, don't get me wrong, uh, but he knew that he had to tighten up on his safety game, his overall game, and his overall game over the last couple of years has gone from strength to strength. And it, the big the big part of his success is. Uh, that he's matched a lot of the guys with his safety and he's been a little bit more measured in his approach. But when he has got in now, you know, he has the confidence, he's got the success and he's kept the momentum going. I mean, and what he's done this season, he's won six ranking tournaments uh, before going into the World Championship. And that's without the likes of uh, the China Championship that he would have had a chance in. He's going to be playing in the Tour Championship next week. You know, he, he'll be favourite to win that. He's just had an unbelievable... Uh, amount of success over the last couple of years but for me it's down to that he's uh, he's matured his game has matured and he's matured as well and he, he knew the value of being a little bit more measured and, and taking a little more sort of consideration when he had to play good safety against the top players and that's how he's got that's how he's got more success But and when he got his chance of course he's brilliant at scoring and brilliant long putter you know, those aspects of his game uh, were always top quality. But always what for me used to let him down was his sort of match play instincts and knowing when and what to do in safety. Not just playing the ABC type shots, but playing very clever safety shots. And I think that's that's improved over the last couple of years. Hey, players players like Roddy Sullivan are probably only going to be doing about four or five years behind you in terms of, you know, playing. Yeah, yeah. Age, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have... You know, you were quite established when Ronnie was coming in, and um, all of a sudden you've got this like this guy, this flush. All of a sudden hits the base, and he's banging in big long, he's scaring the crap out of everybody with his long pattern and yeah, and what have you. I mean, uh, did you did you find Ronnie quite intimidating as a player, and or how did you feel playing against him? Uh, did I find him quite intimidating? Not really. I mean, I've had, I've had some great battles with him over the years, but at times, at times, like, you know, he was unstoppable, you know? Mm. I mean, I played, 
I, uh, I mean, like I've, I've had some success against them over the years, you know, in tournaments. There's no doubt about that, you know. But uh, I think the I played him in the UK final one year, and he was all he was like unstoppable, unstoppable. I think it was it might have been 2000. I can't remember what year it was, uh, but I lost in the final of the UK to Ronnie. He beat me ten one, and uh, I was lucky to get one. <laughs> he was like he was like on top of his game every chance he was getting he was winning the frame he was just he was unstoppable then uh and that's about that's almost 20 years ago you know so uh he was a, an incredible and still is an incredible player and uh at times he was he was frightening you know but I, funny enough i used to love playing him i used to i used to really love the atmosphere of playing him he was one of those players the likes when you play Jimmy White or Hendry or like uh, even Alex Higgins when he was in his day, uh, they were it, the buzz of playing those type of players was just a different league to playing anybody else, you know. So well, it really sort it excited you more than sort of uh, frightened you playing them, you know. Quite significant to you too because he, he, he in, a, in a kind of way springboarded you, didn't he? Because the practice with him just yeah. prior to winning your first world championship. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean yeah, 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 and. I mean, I was in Ilford since 1988. Uh, now, he was only, I think he was only about 12 when I first met him. Might have been even 10. Uh, so, I was, I used to practice with him from the age of, uh, yeah, he would have been about 12. I think I'm six years old. Then. So, I, from the age of 12, I was practicing with Ronnie O'Sullivan, you know. And even then, he was good to practice with. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen him, I've seen him develop into, such a wonderful player and uh, a genius, really, you know, and, and what he can do mm -hmm. on the table. So it was great to see him at such a young age. I mean, I remember when his father used to send a taxi for me to go and practice with him. He had a table at the bottom of his garden and he'd send a car for me. Will you come down and practice with my son? You know, he needs to be playing players like you. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he learned so much from playing. And he was only 12 at the time, like, you know, and he, well, wow. you know, uh, yeah, well, but he was, uh, he was still fantastic to play with even then. Paul then and in terms of you know as, as you progressed you know in, in your career mm. very long career did you uh did you take the help of uh, uh from others did, did you get assistance from coaches or main coaches did you uh as i you know something i wish i wish i had of mm. uh i was basically a sort of self-taught you know i didn't mm. get any coaching from anybody uh i had a coach Paddy Miley, who would sort of teach me more, he wouldn't really teach me about cue actions or anything like that. Mm -hmm. He was basically just about match play and playing matches and, mm -hmm. you know, just to keep my concentration, play good safety, you know what I mean? This this tactics, because he used to be, he was an international player himself, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a good, he was really good sort of soundboard mm -hmm. more than anything. Uh, but I never had a, a sort of technical coach ever. Um and uh, I mean, I, I work a little bit now with a good friend of mine, Pat Caulfield. Uh, and I mean, he's not a qualified coach, around, but he knows the game a long, long time himself, mm -hmm. you know. So, but he's helped me, uh, you know, since I basically turned professional. Uh, but not so much really a lot of technical stuff, really just, you know, help me with practice and, and other stuff like that, you know. I, I think, uh, I don't know whether you'd agree, but... I think there, there is a lot of talent out there, Ken, on the tour, and they just need to sort of find themselves, you know, yeah. and, and and get those wins. And and I I personally believe it's it's just it's just up yeah. here. And I think uh, and that that's the type of new coach. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I, I, like I, I completely, completely, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, I've been in the latter part of my career. I went to some sort of uh, like. Uh, guys who would try and help me with my confidence and stuff like that like mind coaches you know mm -hmm. i think uh i think that's very important i think and i wish i had have uh, done it a lot earlier in my career you know because but back when you got back to 1990 nobody really knew about mind coaches and people didn't delve into mind they thought they for a strange reason that they thought that that was a weakness you know what i mean if they were speaking to mind coaches if you go back 30 years yeah. Now, nowadays it's like common fodder you know so um i wish that i had have done it a lot earlier in my career uh, i think it would have helped me a lot more and i think 
I definitely would have won a lot more with a lot more help. But I wasn't. I was a little bit sort of close to it, uh, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been as open to it as I would be now. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think support is one of the big things. You know, for the players. You know, guys, you don't need you, you don't need to have a coach if you don't feel you need one. A lot of players like him, self-taught, come in and, and done as well as they have without coaches. But there's times when you need a lot of support, maybe yeah. in terms of psychological psychological yeah. support, in terms of traveling and looking after your logistics. A lot of a lot of young lads struggle with that, Ken. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah. Oh. Well, I mean, a lot a lot of young lads starting off probably they can't afford it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at Joe Trump. Uh, I mean, he got his brother to come or give up his job and come around with him for the last couple of years. And look, mm -hmm. look at what sort of help he's given him. You know, he's had he has someone on his on his side all the time, someone he can talk to, mm -hmm. someone that can help him, like Jordan, the good times and the bad times. You know, and it's done him the world good. So uh, yeah, so even if it's a you know family member, a good friend, uh, somebody who understands the game, knows what they're talking about, someone that you can talk to about snooker that that has a snooker brain that can talk talk sense back to you you know and uh, i think that's very very important you know because as you said the game itself is 90 percent mental everybody can go in and make all the, the guys on the tour you know they can make centuries or one four sevens in their club and you know mm -hmm. you know every day of the week but uh it's the mental side it's being in that right positive uh, state of mind Every time you go out and you play someone else who's trying to stop you from playing, that's when the uh, that's where the the positive sort of strategy and thought process comes into it. Just want to slide off you a wee bit here, Ken, because you're uh, you're a lot of information here for the guys to take, and we're going to touch on some questions. Okay, normally you get two or three in one hit, but I've read a couple here. Some of the guys want to know who are your toughest opponents and why. My toughest opponents over the years, uh, definitely right. Stephen Hendry. Stephen Hendry was like, uh, for us, when we turned pro, uh, like I turned pro in 1990, but the likes of Higgins, O'Sullivan, Williams came along in 1992. And uh, for us, the benchmark was Stephen Hendry. He sort of revolutionized the game uh, that, you know, we all became much better sort of much more aggressive believe it or not like because of him you know because he brought the game to a new level so we had to to keep up with him we mm -hmm. had to be much pro much more prolific break builders which we were um and we had to as well as play good lady, but we had to score we had to win frames in one visit you know mm -hmm. like he was doing and that's what he brought to the game you know the blue off the spot smash the pack and try and try and make the make the uh, win the frame in one visit. That's that's what he did, and um, I was involved with that. Peter Ebden, you could add, is another one. You know, we had uh, as you said, O'Sullivan, Higgins, and Williams, and then also you had the likes of uh, you know Alan McManus, who was a top player at those days as well, and you still had Jimmy White, who was still a top player in the nineties when we because he was still getting the finals, he was still winning tournaments. Like Jimmy White was. Jimmy White was an unbelievable uh, talent, you know, and such a, I mean, such a tough player to play against, you know, because mm -hmm. because of all the crowd that you were playing against as well, you know, when he came out to play against you, like the roar and the crowd support he used to get was just phenomenal, you know, uh, and he was still at the top of his game, even during mm -hmm. that time. Steve Davis was still one of the best players in the world when I, when I turned pro, you know, so... Uh, so we had it all, like, you know, that era was very, very difficult. But it was a great era to be playing snooker in, you know. So when you were playing these great players, talk about some of your tough, toughest players there, Ken. Uh, see when things went wrong, Ken, for you. See when things sort of went very, very wrong, you know, when yeah. you were feeling really low. How, how did you get yourself, how did you reassert yourself? How did you get, how did you deal with the problems or get your focus back? What, what kind of things did you do? I used to be a parent and... and I forget about snooker for two days. I wouldn't come out. Sometimes I wouldn't come out of the apartment. I'd go out, go to the shops or something like that. Uh, stay mm -hmm. in, and then I'd after a couple of days, I'd be back up to Ilford, and I'd be back on the practice table, and I'd be getting ready for the next tournament. You know what I mean? And that's all. And when you were up in Ilford, we used to have a system there. Even though I had my own table and all, we'd always play best of seven. Winner stays on. Like you know what I mean? So. Because there were not only Ronnie and myself, there was like Stephen Morphy was there, Joe Swell was there for a time, 
Fergal O'Brien was there, Michael Judge was there. Then you had Nick Terry, Stuart Reardon, Mickey Rowan, all these like guys who were on the tour as well. So you had about Mark King, you had about 10 professionals coming in now at Vilford every day. And it was only like two decent tables, you know. So you were playing best of sevens on and off. Like, you know, winner stays on, the loser comes off and has to wait his turn. So it was good. It was good practice. And uh, it was the only way to get over a defeat, just get back up to the club and get back on the table. So just bite the bullet and move on. Keep yeah. playing. Forget about the last yeah. turn. Yeah. Just yeah. keep the playing. Worst, the worst thing you can do is dwell on a defeat, you know. The best way of getting over it is have a day or two off and then get back up, back on the practice table and just suck it up, you know, and learn from your mistakes. And just looking at your timeline a wee bit there, Ken, I'll make, I'll make this as painless as possible. Mm. You sort of like, you you know, you, you first sort of 20 years there, you were steady, top 16, 16 of, those, 16 of those years. And then you sort of slowed down a wee bit when you hit 40. Mm. I, I don't know, what is that? Is that like a 40 thing when you turn, when you, when, oh, is it midnight uh, or something? What's, what's going on there? What happened? Uh, I, to be honest, I don't know. I just, I lost, uh, I don't know. I just, after I fell out of the top 16, I found it very difficult to... You know, when you were going to qualifiers in Prestatin and, you know, that you weren't like, you weren't the top dog anymore. And you had to, you know, fight your way through all those qualifiers. I found that very difficult, you know, and I found that very difficult to cope with. And uh, I think that's when I start trying to use like um, sports psychology a bit more to try and get that, get, try and get that confidence back. And it was just like, it was sort of like a vicious circle. You'd win one or two matches, but you couldn't get on a run uh, like I did before when I was in the top 16, you know? And it's just, I think it's just the confidence sort of drained and drained and drained, like from me, you know? Yeah. But like perhaps maybe dropping off the turn, going back to Q School, you know, you, you sort of, yeah. you know, you've been in the top 16 for, you know, nearly two decades, and then all of a sudden you're slipping down the rankings, you're slipping down to 40, 50. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know what? I'm having that. You do, sometimes you do get, you get a bit embarrassed sometimes of your performances, and you think, like, why is this happening? Well, you know it's why it's happening, because I'm not confident anymore. I probably wasn't practicing. I hadn't got the yours to practice as much, but I'd still, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd still be down, like, three or four hours a day, but maybe you know, when I was in the sixth day and I was down like maybe six or eight hours a day, you know, so uh, it was just, uh, it was difficult. I think when I fell out at 16, I dropped down outside of 32. I just found it very, very difficult, you know. And did you, in, in terms of playing hours and practicing time and out there, did you reduce that practicing time or were you yeah, still? Yeah, well, you know, I suppose when I got married, family came along, then the time sort of dwindled away a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's just the way it was, you know. And then other things came into your life that you were doing and was keeping you preoccupied. So I was probably spending less and less time on the table. Uh, but it didn't stop me from. I mean, I love, I love the competition, love the competing side. Uh, but maybe I just didn't practice then as much as I as I as I used to when I was living in England, you know. Well, some of the questions, some of the lads. Keep sending them in, lads. I'll just look over on the right, but I try, I try and touch on very significant things. Maybe that will be of benefit to you. Yeah. Can't talk about them, but uh, you know, some of the guys are. I mean, what what sort of practice routines have you got, Ken? Do you play a lot of solo? Or do you like to play different players all the time? Or what? Uh, no, I do. I do play solo. Uh, now the odd time I'd play Fergal O'Brien a game. I'd go down to his club, or he'd come up to me. Um, the good thing is Sean Murphy has moved to Dublin, so I can play yeah. him a little bit now. Yeah, which is great. And uh, I also play Michael George, who used to be on the tour with us, who's playing a lot on the seniors tour. So I play him a bit. But mainly, yeah, I go down with my friend Pat or Mick, and I just do the routines and uh, just do do a good bit of solo, you know? Yeah. Sean, Sean rings me up at 2 o'clock in the morning begging me to come on here. <laughs> you know, I, I got a message from him weeks ago, you know, and I, I said, Sean, just wait. Just just hang on, you know, just just take your turn. Wait your turn. <laughs> he says, I'm fighting with a wife. I can't sleep. 
I don't know, you know, I, 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 what's going on here, Dave? You know, look, I'll let you on. You know, and he rings me up. I don't understand him on. Does he do that to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good lad. That was great to have him in Dublin, you know, and uh, he's got a lovely setup where he is now in the Stevens Green Club. And yeah. uh, we'll, we'll definitely be getting some practice in before the World Championship comes up now in a few weeks' time. Fergal O'Brien. Yeah. Hot man. A lot of good input there, you know. He's not very exciting to watch. He's not very exciting to watch, but he's got a lot of good stuff, you know. Yeah, he's a good Fergal. lad. He's a good lad. <laughs> I, I love Fergal. He's great, you know. Yeah, he's oh, good he's lad. Good. Yeah. I tell you what, I tell you what, I wish, you know, like over the years, I wish I had the same application as what Fergal has had, you know, because if there's one man deserves anything out of this game, it's Fergal, you know. Now, I know we've won the British Open and that. Uh, his only ranking tournament, but uh, what a great, what a great player he is in his practice. You know, when you go down there and play him on his oh, own table, it's tough tell to you, play. What, you know you're in for a tough afternoon when you're down there playing, oh. playing with him. You know, you know the frame might take two hours, but it's got to be good. It's got to really, not always, you, know, not always. you know, sometimes it takes him five that's, minutes to play a shot. That's you just know, a joke. That's just a, that's just a joke. Is cute. <laughs> Sorry, Fergo, I love you, that bitch. You know I'm only joking. You know. Right, we're going to talk about, I always ask this anyway, we're going to talk about tables, cues, and tips. What kind of cue and tip you use there, Ken? Um, what am I using now? I'm using, I normally use Elk Masters. Mm -hmm. Yep. That seems to be an old fortune choice. Didn't have to play much with it, yeah, and it's really good. So I've been, uh, but normally I just always use Elk Masters. I've been using Elk Masters since I, since I started playing for forty years now, you know. So, uh, uh, my cue I picked up in the snooker club. I don't know what make it is. There's no make on it. Um, somebody had left it behind them in the snooker club in Jason's, and of course I didn't have my cue at a cue at the time. I was only about ten. And uh, oh, it was it was put on the somebody had left it behind and it was put on the pill rack, and I picked it off the pill rack. I knew it wasn't a house cue, and I started playing with it, and I loved it. And I asked the manager, "Could I keep it?" And he says, "If you give me a five for it, you can keep it." You know. And uh, I went around to my mother and asked her for a five. I told her I'd do some jobs, and I give her the money back. You know, and I, it was a beautiful cue, and I loved it. And the manager wanted a fiver for it. And uh, so anyway, she gave me the fiver. I went into the post office. I got five pound notes at the time. And uh, like I'm talking about 40 years ago now. And I put three pound notes in my left pocket and two pound notes in my right pocket. And I went back around to the manager. And I had to kill my hand. And I took. I went into my right pocket. And I took the two pounds out. And I had it in my hand like this. And I said, look at. I said, my mother couldn't afford the fiver. I said, she only had two pounds, you know, this is all I have, you know. And he looked at me, poor mouth. He looked at the two pound. He looked at the queue. And he says, give us the blade and two quid then. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, took the, he took the two quid out of me. And I have that queue. I have that queue for 40 years. And everything. Oh, everything 40 years? Ken, have you had that queue for 40 years? Everything I've won. Uh, from the Irish Junior Championships to the Amateur Senior Championships, the World Junior, World Amateur, and World Professional Championship, I won with that two pound cue. I keep telling these lads, Ken, see the cues, see these hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand pound John Paris cues. Boys, forget about it. Ken, Ken has picked up a rat cue and won a World Championship with it. So, by the way, so is Stephen Hendry. You know, so I mean, what's the problem? Just go and get a nice cue. Yeah, yeah. If it feels Always right, get, fine with it. if you get you pick up a cue and it feels good, that's good enough for me. You know. Very, very good. What 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 chalk are you playing with, Ken? Are you using new stuff or what? I'm using the time gold. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I've, I've, had, I've had very little kick since I started using this time chalk. Uh, it's just, I I think it's the best chalk I've ever I've ever had. Like you know, it's just amazing. No no kicks. Not much dust comes off it. You know, there's no, like, chalk marks on the table. Uh, I think it's just fantastic, you know. So I'll continue to use that, I think, until I finish. Same cue, Raku. That's a great story. That's fantastic. 
You know, that's the kind of thing you'd expect to come out. Alex Higgins to come out with, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get on the way to the bar. Alex Higgins, Alex Higgins robbed a few rack cues in his time, you know. I've seen him do it. <laughs> any decent, any decent rack cues, they were off the rack and in his cue case, in a, in a, in a flash. Oh my goodness, sick! So many stories there, mate. Eh? Yeah, 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 so yeah. many stories. My favorite, my favorite Alex Higgins story. Well, I've got a couple of them, but. Uh, I think the first time I met him, I was shaking in my boots. I was, I was walking in guffs in uh, at the Irish Masters. I got a job as like an usher, ushering people into seats and taking their tickets and all that. And I was fourteen at the time, and uh, the tournament director gave me a job, so I'd meet some of the players and be able to watch them play, and it gave me like a real appetite, you know, for you know maybe down the road if I if I kept up my hunger for playing snooker, you know. And the first. My hero was Alex Higgins, was the reason I picked up Snooker. And the I, first time I met him, and he saw me with the Benson Hedges jumper, you know, and I was introduced to him. And he said to me, Hey, kid, you know, you get me a drink while I'm at the tip. I says, Yes, of course, Mr. Higgins. What would you like, you know? Well, he goes, If I ask you for an orange juice, that means a vodka and orange juice, right? <laughs> I said, I said, Mr. Hit, while you're playing, he goes, yes, kid. And if I ask you for a vodka and orange juice, that means a double. <laughs> Get off, okay. <laughs> That's fucking great. You know, absolutely fantastic. You're working at, I don't, I don't know. I've heard mixed sort of stories about the 82 final, kid, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, about what, he, what, he, what he's actually had to drink, you know, yeah, during yeah. that final. What do you reckon? Do you reckon he's had a few? Or, uh, uh, oh, yeah. definitely. He, he was one of those players that actually used to play better when he had a few drinks on him, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've no doubt about that. I mean, Dennis Taylor told me a story. He was playing them in goffs as well. And when you're introduced first into the crowd, that means you're the second seed. So you go to the green pocket, you know? Uh, when you're introduced second, you're the highest seed. You're always sitting at the yellow pocket. So... Uh, Taylor came out, uh, he was introduced for us. Higgins was the higher seed, but Taylor went to the yellow pocket instead, you know, and uh, he went to uh, pour what he thought was the jug of water into the glass. And when he, when he realized it was straight vodka, he knew he was at the wrong seat. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Well, he was one of those players who would play. He would he would play better. He would play better with uh, if he had uh, if he had drink on him, you know. He was an amazing character, mm. you know. He was a great player. He's my hero too, Ken. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I think you know. Uh, uh, it was very sad. I, I tell you, my favorite one is when uh, he came down to play me uh, before the Irish Professional Championship. He hadn't been well. He recovering from cancer, and. Uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, he was playing that evening time. And I said, come down. I said, we'll practice a little bit, you know, to give you a little bit of play before you play. Because I knew he hadn't had a picked up a cue. Mm -hmm. So he came down to the Radisson, 10 o'clock in the morning. He walked in. I said, do you want any breakfast or anything, Alex, you know? And uh, he said, no. He said, just get me a pint of Guinness, you know? I said, yeah, no problem. He took off his coat. He took out his old Holborn tobacco pack. And he started rolling his own, uh, rolling his own ciggies, you know? Mm -hmm. So the point of Guinness came. He took the racing post out of his pocket and he he, he, uh, he ticked off a few of his uh, horses for the day. The Guinness came and he was smoking in the room. He went around the room looking at, at the different uh, photographs on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I his picture is on the wall quite a lot, you know, in, in my snooker room. Mm -hmm. And I brought him over to uh, have a picture with George Best. I played George Best when I was about 18, you know. And I said, I said, here's an old friend of yours, Alex, like over here, Georgie Best, you know. So he came over and he stood in front of the picture like that. And he, he took a drag of the cigarette. And he took a sip of the Guinness and he goes, Georgie Best, he goes, what a waste. <laughs> <laughs> well, I fell around the place laughing. I mean, that was just... And that was ex that was Higgins to a T, you know. That's exactly what. Oh, he God, so many, so many stories, you know, so many stories. Extravagant. He was great. He was, great. He was really. We became, you know, close, and he was really good to me. And he used to ring me up, you know, if I won a match or, 
he rang me up when I was in the final of the World Championship, the second, the second year. Yeah. And uh, I was going out to play the final and he rang and I saw his number. So I answered it, you know, and he goes, win it for the second time like the great Alex Higgins did, he says. <laughs> <laughs> that's all he said to me he said the best of luck babes and that was it you know what i mean he, he was fantastic though he was fantastic fantastic i'm going to start getting through some questions here ken now, this is going to run two hours again all right okay, go on go on here we go no we're gonna we're gonna wait we got a, a double hit question here as a couple of lads asking uh who 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 do you think were the biggest underachievers on the tour and uh a uh, player you've ever seen or played that didn't make it? Uh, oh. uh, there was well, you know something when I when I went over to England, uh, for us in the in Lady eighty eight, uh, there was so many good players, you know, on the pro am circuit, you know, who could play, make centuries, and who'd win, you know, like I say, say for example, there's one player there, Barry Pinches. You know, he used to win pro arms, pro arms, pro arms all the time. When mm -hmm. he turned pro, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't do it. You know, what? and he was one of the most prolific. I mean, during the year of like say eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety before I turned pro, it was Barry Pinches or Peter Ebden uh, who I'd be playing more, more than not in pro arms up and down the country. You know, uh, and they they'd be winning the pro arms like all the time and and he could he just couldn't take it to the pro table he was he was a fantastic player uh one of the players who i, I don't like to use underachiever I, I don't think that's fair you know but i think uh i think Andy hamilton was one of those players who had a lot of mm -hmm. talent and uh he's only won one tournament but could have done a lot better you know he just uh I think he, he was a fantastic uh, break builder, you know, good all round game, very prolific break builder. And I thought he could have won a few more tournaments than he did, like, you know, but still, still, uh, yeah, I think he, he was one of those that could have done a lot better, I think, you know. And any new players have catch, caught your eye in any way you're impressed with? Yeah, I think I like, uh, I, I love Jack Dazowski. I think he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be very successful. Uh, once he gets his sort of, he has to do with Judd Trump now. You know what what Judd Trump did, and mm -hmm. um, he has to become a little bit more mature. You know, on the table wise, but I think he's a fantastic talent. Luca Brassell, who just won the the tournament last week, I think he's he he could do a lot in the game as well. Uh, I don't think he's going to be a very consistent player, Luca Brassell, mm -hmm. but I think he's one of those that could win at tournaments. You know, he could just fly for a week. You know? miss him for a couple of weeks and then well he's going to be one of those players that could really do damage you know well, hopefully we'll be talking to him next week guys Luca, might be on next week we're going to talk look yeah. as a uh, young guy he's a young player he's going to mature yeah and he's very 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 talented player very talented player and a oh, lovely very level-headed very level-headed very down to earth you know nice guy so yeah and I, I was delighted he won last week he played really well you know a couple of lads here are asking about Irish sugar Ken uh, what's happening in the future of Irish snooker exit? Uh, blah 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 blah. Well, I think a lot of good things. I mean, Aaron, young Aaron, it's just I'm very impressed with young Aaron. Yeah, he's a good player. Know. Yeah, looking forward to seeing him on the tour. And uh, yeah, I'm very impressed with him. Uh, and I haven't seen like Ross Bullman is probably another one that could have been on, a, on the tour already. You know, he just lost out by wow. one frame, just lost out by one frame. So, uh, but yeah, I think uh. Those two lads are the best in Ireland at the moment. Oh, they are. Is it yeah. too soon, maybe? I'm thinking maybe a, week, maybe a season or two too soon. Yeah, but I mean, oh. like they, they need the experience of being on the tour and playing yeah. in a lot of tournaments and giving themselves opportunities, you know? But what have they got to lose? They've got nothing to lose. They've got nothing to lose, no, exactly. You no, know, they've got everything, absolutely everything to gain. So uh, let's just touch on the hardest to play again. So I've answered that one already. Quite often you answer the questions before they even get on there, you know. So uh, basically the formats, we talk about numbers of professionals. 128 professionals on the tour, Ken. Is that a good number? Is that fine or should there be less? What do you think? No, no, I think I think that's fine. I think I think the numbers are good. I don't think, I think if you had it down to 64, it'd be too small a tour. Uh, I think to give 
you know, players like amateurs around the world the incentive to get on the tour. I think 128 is a fair number because if you had if you had only 64 on the tour, a lot of the amateurs they may lose interest in trying to qualify because it'd be so difficult to qualify. There wouldn't be many spaces available each year. So uh, I think the system that they have at the moment is probably the fairest system they've ever had. Yeah, Colin Phillips is asking me uh, which player was the hardest to play against in your career. I think you probably answered that one. Yeah, I mean, all those lads. I mean, I, I came up in an era playing Hendry, playing mm -hmm. Jimmy White, playing John Higgins, Mark Williams, uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan, Peter Ebden, all those lads, and Steve Davis as well. They were all the toughest players I've played, like, without a doubt. There's a good question. You like this one. Which player would you like to spend an evening with at the bar swapping stories? I uh, think there's only one. Well, there's a, there's a few of them, but I I think uh, I mentioned one earlier, Joe Swale. Uh, I miss him being on the circuit, you know, and uh, and Jimmy White as well. I, lo I love Jimmy White. And I, but I my my I think the guys that I I have the best time with now are uh, when we're doing the commentary with John Virgo and Dennis Taylor. We, the three of us, we never stop laughing, you know, telling stories, having dinner, uh, having a few drinks and, and telling like snooker stories or telling jokes. We, we're all the three of us at every, any BBC tournament, the three of us would be together and we'd be all laughing our heads off, you know. I want to touch on that because we're going to wrap this up very, very shortly, Ken. Uh, I just want to talk to you about the TV stuff. Uh, um, talk the water, talk the water, Ken. You, you, you're, I mean, you're amazing. I mean, you've been doing the TV commentary now for a really long time. It doesn't matter who you do it for, because it's always good to have a work an ex-world champion or a player of your status on there to play. Are you really enjoying the, the TV stuff? Would you like? Yeah, I do. I do. I love it. I mean, uh, I think I've been doing it about ten years now, but I do. I enjoy it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I talk to myself, I'd be only sitting at home watching it because I love watching this game. I love the game itself. Uh, I love the intriguing sort of matches that are, you know, unfolding on a screen. So the fact that you're there and you're watching it or you're commentating, it's just like, it doesn't get any better than that. You know, it was either that or I'd be sitting at home with myself, I'd be commentating to myself. Like, you know, so at least I'm there and I'm getting paid for it as well. I mean, it's not, it's not like it's hard work, you know what I mean? You can sit at home and talk to yourself if you want. No. But carry on with it. You've got to carry on with the commentate and want to see you more on television because if you keep doing it, you're going to be up there with me. You're going to be up there. With me. Oh, you know, just keep doing it. You know, you'll be all right. You know, you'll be. I'll let, I'll let you stand in for me, Ken. I'll let you stand okay. in for me. Okay. Nice, nice. Right. We're going to, boys, we're going to wrap this up really, really, really soon. So, last thing I'm going to ask you, Ken. Okay. This is an easy question. Very easy question. What do you? What's happening with you? What do you want to do next? What's left? What's left inside you? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Uh, good question. Uh, I'd love to. I know it's going to be difficult, but I think I'd love to play at the Crucible once more. Uh, I'd love that would be fantastic to come out to come out through the curtains onto the play in the Crucible. I did it a few years ago, and I got down and kissed the ground, like you know what I mean, like. Uh, because I was so happy to be back. It was, it's just got a lot of great memories for me, you know, uh, playing so many great matches over the years that I've played in, um, at the crucible. So I'd love to play there once more. That would be a nice send off. And I don't know. I, I love, I love the game. I love playing it. I love commentating as that, but I love playing it more and I love competing. So as long as I still enjoy, enjoy that, I'll keep playing. So, I hope to stay on the on the circuit for at least another couple of years, and I'll play I'll play on that circuit and I'll play in the senior circuit hopefully as well, you know, because I think oh, that that has a good future as well, you know, the seniors. You might come up against me, Ken. <laughs> I, I look forward sharp. to that. I look forward to that. I'm sharp. I'm a big hitter. I'm a big hitter. Big long ball. <laughs> uh, you're saying you're 64 in the world, so yeah. Is there is there something to be concerned about there at the minute? Or uh, well, I, I think. I think I've got a. I might have to win a match in the world, or maybe two matches to keep my card. But uh, we'll see how it goes. You know, was. Uh, I, I, I played all. I mean, I played all right last week. If I can keep up to a standard like that, uh, you know, 
I don't think anybody will look forward to playing me in the qualifiers if I can play as well as they played against Mafflin and against Neil Robertson last week. So that that will give me a bit of confidence. And uh, I'm going to really practice hard now for the next four weeks before the world qualifiers and then see what happens. Well, I look, I'm going to get Barry Hearn a ring and I'm going to tell him that if he doesn't keep you on the tour for whatever reason, I'm going to come for you, Barry. You've got to <laughs> keep, him there, keep him on the tour or you're in trouble. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Ken, can you believe that we've actually managed to keep this down to 65 minutes? <laughs> Brilliant. I am I am over the moon. Yeah. You know, I've been drinking, look, I've been everybody thinks I'm an alcoholic, by the way. I've been <laughs> drinking coffee, you know, the only time the only time I've had to have a drink is with Fergal O'Brien and Patrick Wall. <laughs> I mean, those two, those two would drive you to drink, Ken. They would drive you to drink just watching them, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Murphy. They're good lads, though. They're good lads. Mark Davis. They're good That's lads. Why I'm so much red wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're good lads. Ken, guys, thanks very much for joining us. Big thank you to Ken. Anytime, anytime. As I say, guys, next week we got, hopefully, we got Luca coming on. We're going to talk to the kid. He's a great young player. And uh, I think a lot of potential, a lot of potential for the future. So okay. uh, keep keep up to date with everything about the competitions and all the rest of it. 